It's an MLB Draft Wednesday. Let's talk about the teams that have extra picks on day one and what they need to do with them. You are Locked On MLB Prospects, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Yes, welcome on in to Locked on MLB Prospects, your home for all things minor league baseball. I'm your host, Lindsey Crosby, award-winning baseball writer and podcaster, and thank you for making this your first listen every single day. We're proudly part of the Locked on Podcast Network, where it's your team every day, and today's episode is brought to you by our friends at FanDuel. Make every moment more. New customers, join today and you'll get $150 in bonus bets if your first bet of $5 or more wins. Visit FanDuel.com slash Locked on to get started. So uh, there are several teams this summer in the MLB draft that have extra picks uh, to be made on day one. And there are several reasons why a club can get extra picks on day one. So after the first round, the first 30 teams, there are three different, technically four different sets of additional picks. You have the prospect promotion incentive picks. Reminder here, If a player is on at least two of three specified top 100 prospect lists, in this case, Baseball America, MLB Pipeline, and ESPN, if they're on at least two of those three, was on the opening day roster, and goes on to win the Rookie of the Year award, that club gets a prospect prospect promotion incentive pick after the first round. Julio Rodriguez won the first one back in, like, after 22. And then Corbin Carroll and Gunnar Henderson won them for 23. So the Diamondbacks pick at 31, the Orioles pick at 32. Those are extra picks. You also have compensatory picks, which are if you give a qualifying offer to a player, he declines it and signs somewhere else for at least $50 million, you get a pick. Now, if the team that loses the player is a team that receives revenue sharing money, then you get a pick after those PPI picks before the competitive balance round A. So the Minnesota Twins, the Cardinals signed Sonny Gray. The Cardinals forfeited the second round pick. The Twins got number 33 overall, which honestly, ridiculous that you give up a pick for a two or three year thing. And that's why when people are saying, yeah, sign Blake Snow to a one year deal. Don't sign Blake Snow to a one year deal because you lose a draft pick to do it. Unless you... I guess technically, if you pay him under $50 million, you don't lose a draft pick. But still, don't sign a guy to a, to a short-term deal. In this case, Sonny Gray's two or three years. Don't sign him to a short-term deal when you lose a draft pick for it. And then competitive balance rounds A and B. It's the 10 smallest markets and the 10 smallest revenue pools. Now, there's a lot of overlap here. So you're not giving out a ton of these picks, right? You gave out a grand total of, tw- of 12 of these picks. I can't do math. 14 of these picks between a potential 20 because there's some overlap here. But some of those picks come after competitive balance round A. Some of those picks after competitive balance round B. And it alternates between the two rounds each year. These are the only picks that can be traded with certain rules. You can only trade the pick one time. So the team that acquires it has to use it. They can't trade it to somebody else. And you can't trade it for cash. You have to trade it for a player. We talked about this the other day. We talked about draft pick trades. So Arizona Diamondbacks have extra picks here because they got a compensatory pick or they got a PPI pick for Corbin Carroll. So it's at 31. And then they got pick 35 in competitive balance round A. So they have 29, 31, 35, and 65. And the slot value of these four picks, just these four, Last year, those four numbers was $9.07 million. And it's interesting to look at what teams have done in these same draft slots in the past, and then what this team has done with their picks in previous years. So last year, those four picks, three of those four players were Prepsters. And it feels like you're in that sweet spot towards the back of the first round where you can take a prepster, not necessarily a little bit higher than he would have been picked, 
but you can go grab a prepster, a high ceiling prepster there, and then make up the money either if you hit if you picked earlier or if you picked later. Like Seattle. Outfielder Johnny Farmello at 29. They took a they had three first round picks last year because they had their competitive balance pick. They had their PPI for Julio Rodriguez. They had their standard pick, right? So they took a prep outfielder. The Tampa Bay Rays at 31 took a prep shortstop, Adrian Santana. The Marlins at 35 took their second straight prep pitcher, left-hand pitcher Thomas White. They actually got the top righty prep pitcher and the top lefty prep pitcher in the draft last year. And then the Rockies at 65 took college catcher slash outfielder slash we don't really know where he's going to play, but he's interesting, Cole Carrig out of San Diego State. And it seems like the trend for those picks to just take a bunch of prepsters would have been what we just automatically assumed that the Diamondbacks were going to do until last year's draft. Because if you go back and you look what they did in the previous five years, right? So 2019, pick number 16, Corbin Carroll, prepster. That totally worked out, right? 2020, pick number 18, right-hand pitcher Bryce Jarvis out of Duke. He was a guy that was a good reliever in a small sample last year for Arizona. 11 appearances, only one start. ERA, two and run record in 23 innings in the majors. He mostly was a starter in the minors. He made 19 starts and 27 appearances, but he came up as a reliever last year. And again, looked fine. The question is going to be, because he struggled in AAA in his starts, like a 5-2-6 ERA, are they going to make him into a, let him try to be a starter again, or just have him be a reliever? I don't quite know. I haven't just seen a lot of work on that. Haven't done a lot of work, honestly, on Bryce Jarvis. 2021, the number six overall pick for the Diamondbacks, shortstop Jordan Lawler out of high school. 2022, famous pick here, number one, two, number two overall, outfielder Drew Jones out of high school, who we've barely seen because of multiple injuries, whether it was the, the shoulder issue that happened his first batting practice after being signed, or the muscular issues he had last year. I think it was like a hamstring. And then it seems pretty obvious the theme here is like high ceiling prep talent for the most part. And then they took shortstop Tommy Troy from Stanford at number 12 last year. And so questions about what they do. Position doesn't really matter in the first round, but you can still look at themes and then what the team needs. So themes, they have position player depth in the minor leagues, right? To me, they really need pitching. When you look at, I'm going to use the Baseball America top one, uh, top prospect list because I have that up in front of me right now. Their top two pitching prospects are number seven and number eight in the system. Number eight is Dylan Ray, who is a guy they took in the fourth rounder in 22. And I don't think he made it above high A Hillsboro last year. And then Yu Min Lin, the lefty, who is a low velocity, change up dominant lefty who did really well in the minors, but I honestly don't know if the ceiling at the major league level is anything better than a number five. He's throwing 92 miles an hour. And it 92 with a changeup, his, his prominent non-fastball, it just feels like the package is not overwhelming enough to be anything more than a number than a number five or so. And so if Baseball America has those two guys as the top pitching prospects in this system, it's clear the organization needs some high ceiling pitching prospects. So I don't quite know exactly where they go with this, but if it were me, I would look at doing something like the Tam- uh, like the Miami Marlins did and trying to find go with that high ceiling prep talent thing that you've been that you've gone to that well over and over again and go s- uh, figure out which prep pitchers you like the most and maybe and grab say probably two of them and you can either buy somebody down to one of those picks if you need to by taking a taking a, a cheaper college player in one of those slots or you can just keep getting position players knowing that you can make trades because you've shown the ability to develop these position players Corbin Carroll was amazing Jordan Lawler looks like he could be amazing Tommy Troy had a pretty good debut you can scout pretty well you can make these picks pretty well and when they're healthy, so shout out Drew Jones, when they're healthy, they've been able to perform pretty well in the minors. And so you either 
get pit, get position players with the intention of eventually trading them for pitching or go get some high ceiling pitching prospects with these multiple first round picks and the $9 million that you have. Uh, a team that has even more money than the Diamondbacks is the Milwaukee Brewers. We'll break down what they should do next right here on Locked on MLB Prospects. But first, today's episode is brought to you by our friends at FanDuel. Get buckets with your first bet on FanDuel, America's number one sportsbook, because right now, new customers get $150 in bonus bets with any winning $5 bet. It's $150 if your bet wins. You can bet your favorite NBA players and teams. They have quick bets, live same game parlays, exclusive props, and more. I really hope if you were already doing this for the All-Star game, you took the over because that was absurd. Shout out. Not having any defense whatsoever in the All-Star game. Also, don't know how MLB is the only sport that gets this All-Star game right. But anyway, visit FanDuel.com slash Locked On to shoot your shot today with FanDuel, the official sports book of the Locked On Podcast Network. Okay, back to looking at teams that have additional draft picks on day one this year. The Milwaukee Brewers have four picks, okay? So they get number 17. That's their own pick that they get by virtue of their finish last year. And then after that, they have pick number 34, which was originally given to the Orioles, but that was the third piece of the return in the Corbin Burns trade. They got infielder Joey Ortiz, who will probably probably play third base this year and then be the shorting stor- starting shortstop after Willie Adamas leaves either at the trade deadline or in free agency after the season. They also have 58 and they have a pick in competitive rounds bound competitive balance round B number 68. I really cannot talk today. This is amazing. This is the second podcast I've recorded in the last hour. I did an episode of Locked on Braves solo hosting for our guy Jake. Had to step away for a couple days for a family emergency. So bear with me prospectors. I'm doing the best I can. And looking at, okay, so this is even more money than the Diamondbacks got. The Diamondbacks had 9.07 and they had three picks in a six pick span, 29, 31, and 35. This is 34, 58, 68, but the bonus pool is larger because the first one is number 17. And you'll remember the, the, the slot values for these picks dramatically drop during the first round. So if you look at what each player makes at each spot, last year's number one overall pick, the slot value was $9.72 million for Paul Skeens. He signed for 9.2. Dylan Cruz at number two was $9 million. By the time you got to pick 17, it was less than half of that. $4.17 million was the value. That was Enrique Bradfield of the Orioles, by the way. We'll get to him in a minute. He signed for exactly slot value. So, and then that is why you see you see these pools be different. Number 29, that is that was the first pick the Diamondbacks will have, that's only like $2.8 million. The values drop so significantly, so aggressively in the first round. That's why instead of having three late in first round picks like the Diamondbacks do, the Brewers can have 17, 34, and then a second, and then competitive balance after the second and have more money. But anyway... These picks, I mentioned Enrique Bradford at 17. Last year at 34 was Minnesota. They took right-hand pitcher Charlie Soto, a prep pitcher. 58 was Cleveland, the Guardians. They took left-hand pitcher Alex Clemmy, another prep pitcher. And then 68 was the Cubs. They took college pitcher Jackson Wiggins uh, out of Arkansas. So a bunch of pitchers and half between prep and, and college. And then this team specifically... A lot of what they've done, and keep in mind, new general manager, David Stearns has left. So uh, their previous picks had been really high on like contact ability, guys that had fallen in the draft a little bit. They liked college guys. If you go back, they've had a lot. They had eight picks in the last six drafts because they had competitive balance and things like that. 2018, they took Bryce Terang out of high school, pick number 21. That was, the, I believe, the last time they took a prepster until last year. Yeah. Ethan Small, the pitcher out of Mississippi State in 2019, pick number 28. 
Garrett Mitchell, the outfielder out of UCLA in 2020 at pick 20. 2021, they had two. Sal Frelick out of Boston College at number 15. Tyler Black out of Wright State at 33. 22, they had shortstop Eric Brown out of Coastal Carolina at 27. And then in 23, they took third baseman Brock Wilkin out of Wake Forest at 18. And Josh Noth, the prep pitcher, the prep righty, at number 33. And so you can see right here how this works. Wilkin's expected to be a super fast mover. Wilkin could be the starting third baseman as soon as I think the end, probably the end of 25. If not earlier, if he has a stupid, amazing year, but it could be the end of 25. You could have Ortiz at short and Wilkin at third on the last day of the season. Anyway, and so when you look at what this organization does and what they need, they've got some high ceiling pitchers, again, Using Baseball America, there's three pitchers in their top six. You got Jacob Mizorowski, number two. You've got D.L. Hall, who you just acquired from the Orioles at five. Some places already have him as graduated. I think that's a number of days, think. And then Robert Gasser, Bob Gass, the lefty, at number six. But you lost Corbin Burns. Brandon Woodruff, you just re-signed him to a two-year deal. He's got to rehab all of this year. Again, it's a shoulder issue. I'm so much more nervous about shoulders than I am about uh, elbows and things like that because there's just so much more that can go wrong in the structure of the shoulder on a surgery. So it feels like the strength, you have some of everything, right? Jefferson Cuero, number three overall prospect, one of the best defensive catchers in the minors. Looks like he's going to be at least an average, if not above average hitter to go along with a catcher you have right now in William Contreras, Assuming he resigns, if not, Cuero can step right in as the new guy, right? You've got outfielders, whether it's, you know, Luis Lara, Yofri Rodriguez, who we talked about, I think, on Monday's show. You, you've got, plus you a ton of options for half of the major league level, including Jackson Churio. It's a ton of outfielders. You've got infielders, whether it's Brock Wilkin, uh, Joey Ortiz, like we mentioned, Tyler Black is going to be an infield. Like, you've got a lot of options here. Bryce Terang's already graduated and up. Sal Frelick is playing. Sal's playing some infield, some second base and third base in spring, which is wild to me. So you have some of everything, but you're going to use some of your top pitching prospects in the next year or so. You're going to promote them, and they're going to become starters at the major league level. You have other guys behind them. Carlos Rodriguez. You did just draft Josh Noth, although he's a prepster. But I feel like you need some more pitching here as well. And so I think the Brewers are set. If I had to assume, not knowing the draft tendencies of their current front office, because again, they did change general managers. This is an organization that I would want to use the financial power they have of the nine plus million dollars, get a high ceiling college guy at 17, and then maybe buy down a second one to 34. Just flex the money. If you have to save with the third or the fourth pick, the 58 or 68, if you have to save some money with a, not necessarily a senior sign, but with a college guy that is more of a standard ceiling, that's fine. But I think this is an organization that would be suited based on how they've developed, as well as what they need organizationally, buy down a college pitcher or two, or see who falls, because that's a thing that they've done as well, and jump on that to try to get what you need as well as find value and make a good use of your financial resources, right? Uh, and, and again, position doesn't always matter in the first round. You really should be going for the best kind of talent you can ha- you can find. But one, that doesn't make for a good show, right? Just, hey, draft whoever's best on the board when you get there. That's not necessarily fun. And so that's why we're trying to figure out, okay, Maybe you should, you know, try to buy someone down. Maybe you should try to make something happen. If I'm looking at pitchers here that I'm thinking about, you're probably not going to be in the range to get, and this is very early, but a Chase Burns, a Brody Breck, a Hagen Smith, but one of that next wave of guys, your Jonathan Santucci of Duke, Trey Savage of East Carolina, who is one of my favorite pitchers in this entire draft. He's projected somewhere around 20. You could take him at 17, or you could try to buy him down a little bit farther. Josh Hartle of Wake Forest. Drew Beam of Tennessee. There's a couple different pitchers you could try to just double up on impressive college pitchers 
so that you can keep that high-end pitching pipeline going. In just a minute, let's talk about the Baltimore Orioles. They did trade away one of their four picks. They've only got three, but they've also had a ton of success drafting hitters and pitchers. And what do you do differently with the extra PPI pick that you have now? We'll discuss that next right here on Locked on MLB Prospects. But first, today's episode is brought to you by our friends at Game Time. If you're trying to buy tickets to an event, maybe it's a baseball game, maybe it's a concert, a comedy show, a play, whatever it is, Game Time makes it easy, and they're the only ticket app that gives you complete peace of mind. There's a couple things to really like about how Game Time does things. One, you get the view from your seat before you buy, so you know exactly what to expect. If it's a bad view, obstructed view, whatever, you can see that when you buy the tickets. They also give you an all-in price up front. You don't have to add it to your cart and get to checkout to then see, oh, there's a ton of fees added to this and the ticket price is more than doubled. You get all of that stuff at upfront, an all-in price up front, right? You buy the tickets in seconds with two taps. They're delivered directly to your phone and you've got the game time guarantee. If you find tickets in the same section and row for less than what you paid game time, they will credit you 110% of the difference. It is the fastest growing ticket app in the country for a reason. So take the guesswork out of buying tickets with game time. Download the game time app, create an account, use code locked on for $20 off your first purchase. Again, create an account, redeem code locked on, L-O-C-K-E-D-O-N, for $20 off. Download the Game Time app today. Last minute tickets, lowest price, guaranteed. Final segment of Locked MLB Prospects here on an MLB Draft Wednesday, talking about teams that have extra picks on day one and what they should do with them. The Baltimore Orioles, really interesting one to me because again, they traded one of these picks, right? They traded pick number 34. So they've got 22, they've got 32, they've got 62. 32 was the Gunnar Henderson prospect promotion incentive pick. So these three, again, in last year's class, totaled $7.38 million. And similar to some of the others, there's a theme here with some of the selections last year in those spots. Number 22 Seattle took one of my favorite players in the draft and a guy that I have made sure I got in every FYPD I have done, Cole Emerson, the shortstop, the prep shortstop. One of the best debuts of any prepster last year too. Number 32, the Mets took prep shortstop Colin Houck. And then at 62, the Guardians took right-hand pitcher Andrew Walters out of Miami who moved from the bullpen to the rotation. And then because they were struggling on the back end, they moved him back to the bullpen. But could potentially do either one at the next level. Could be a really good reliever or could potentially be up to a mid-rotation starter. And so two out of three prepsters and then a college guy who fell a little bit because the numbers didn't quite match what we thought they would because of weird usage and just a kind of struggling Miami team last year. Now, in the past, they have taken mostly college guys with one very notable exception uh, when it comes to hitters. And then before that, it was a couple pitchers. So in 17 and 18, they actually took pitchers. At number 21 in, in 2017 was prep pitcher D.L. Hall, who went to the Brewers. So that's a good pick. In 2018, pick number 11 was right-hand pitcher Grayson Rodriguez out of high school. Also worked out when he came back up last year, he was one of the best pitchers down the stretch. 2019, they had the 1-1, Adley Rutschman, Oregon State. Obviously, that pick worked out. 2020, uh, number two overall, outfielder Heston Kierstad, Kirsted, I was told it was Kirsted, out of Arkansas. It hasn't paid off at the major league level yet, but the potential is there. There's a very understandable and easy reason why it's been a little bit delayed to pay off, but it still looks like it will. Uh, 2021, number five overall, outfielder Colton Kowser out of Sam Houston State. 2022, number one overall, famously, instead of Drew Jones, they took Jackson Holiday. And then 2023, the one that was completely out of type because all of these hitters had elite batted ball data. 
they go completely out of type and they take outfielder Enrique Bradfield out of Vandy, who is 80 grade speed, 80 grade defense. We have questions about the power ceiling and the hit tool, right? It's an interesting, this is an interesting one to me because you have outside of those two early first pick pitchers, you have a history here of taking position players and making them into the best potential version of themselves with obviously the jury still being out on on Enrique Bradfield and on the two outfielders, although in the minors they were really good. And so I'm really curious what what the Orioles do here, right? Because the strength of the organization by far easily is position players. You traded away Joey Ortiz. You still have Jackson Holiday. You have, I'm just, I'm going down the list here on Baseball America's top prospects again. Your first position player is number eight, Chase, I'm sorry, your first pitcher is number eight, Chase McDermott. You have Jackson Holiday. You have catcher Samuel Basayo. You have corner infielder Kobe Mayo. There's questions about third base or first base or maybe right field, whatever. Outfielder Hessen Kirstad, Kirsten. Second baseman Connor Norby. Outfielder Enrique Bradfield. You've promoted a bunch of guys like a Gunnar Henderson. Uh, you still have a fantastic wave of position players. You've brought up a pitcher, like Grayson Rodriguez was the big one. D.L. Hall was the, the other big one. And you have some guys behind them who are higher in the minors, like a Cade Povich and a Chase McDermott, who I actually just got both of them in a, in a fantasy draft this weekend. But the second wave of pitching talent I think you need to reinforce that second wave of pitching talent, right? And so this is a really interesting conversation about what they do because you have such a clear and strong preference towards position players and then a history of developing them where I don't know if you actually take pitchers or if you take more position players knowing that the best of the best you can keep and add to your core and the rest of them, you could trade four pitchers like you just went out and got Corbin Burns, right? And this reminds me, and there's probably listeners who are going to laugh because I find a way to bring them up all the time, but this reminds me of the Atlanta Braves, right? The Atlanta Braves have a pretty robust and locked in position player core. And so most of their draft picks, I think they're the only organization over the last, I think it's six years. I, I did this last week like maybe six years, that have spent over 60% of their bonus pool money on pitching. Like the Almost every club has drafted more pitchers than hitters, 27 out of 30, but the Braves are one of six or seven organizations to give more than 50% of bonus money to pitching, and they're the only one to exceed 60%. And that's because, one, they're very good at developing pitching, and two, they don't necessarily need position players, right? The position players are either, what either happens is it's a guy like Michael Harris who ends up adding into the major league roster and they extended him. Or it's a guy who is talented, but isn't quite talented enough to break into this roster and he's used in a trade. So you look at, they made the trade for Matt Olson. They traded away catcher Shailene O'Lears out of Baylor and outfitter Christian Pache. Pache did not work out for the A's. Hasn't really worked out for the Phillies either. Yes, they are doing, like, the A's are doing fine with with Langoliers. But Atlanta did that and a couple pitchers to get Matt Olson, And then Atlanta went back to that to get Sean Murphy. They traded away William Contreras, who they brought up through their farm system. Another guy who was good, but not as good as some of the other options they could have had, like Murphy. So they traded him away, as well as some other pitchers, to get Sean Murphy. And a lot of the trades they've made, they went out, they traded prospect Cole Phillips to, and newly acquired Jackson Kowar, to the Mariners to get Jared Kelnick. And it's something where, do the Orioles pull in Atlanta and just continue getting hitters, make them into the best versions of themselves, and flip them for pitching? Or do they try to draft more pitching to develop their next rotation additions down the road? It's an interesting question. And then if you ask me, the Orioles need to also pull in Atlanta Braves and start extending some of these young guys. Extend Adley, extend Gunner, 
before it gets too incredibly expensive. If you wait until Adley Rutschman's two, a year or two away from free agency, it's going to be a lot more expensive to do it than to do it now. Same thing with Gunner. If you don't do it in the next year, it's going to be a lot more expensive when you try to do it. So pull a page from the Atlanta Braves book and extend those guys as well. Fantastic week this week. Going to be talking about some potential breakout prospects, things like that. So stay tuned. In the meantime, if you got questions for Monday's mailbag, I'm on Twitter at Crosby Baseball, show's on Twitter at Locked on Farm. We've got an email, we've got a Discord, all of that stuff in the episode description in the show notes. Until next time, remember, it's always a great time to pay a minor league.